All right, does everybody see my screen? Yeah, I see it. Great. All right, um, so I guess I'll get started. Um, so the title of the talk is Geometric Lie Algebra Actions on Moduli Spaces for K3 Surfaces. Um, these moduli spaces will be you know, moduli spaces of uh, Bridgeland uh, semi-stable objects. Um, but before we do that, I'm going to sort of review the um, situation for uh, like the local case of a ADE surface. Um, all right, so motivation. Um, and some of it works for, you know, any surface. So let S be any uh, smooth surface. Um, you know, ADE. Um, I mean, you know, we'll work over C. Uh, and then we're also going to make the assumption that um, the fundamental group of the surface is zero, so we don't get any, uh, you know, families of line bundles. Um, so Nakajima, Krasnowski, uh, give an action of the Heisenberg algebra modeled in the cohomology of the surface on the direct sum of the cohomologies of all the Hilbert schemes of points of that surface. Um, right, so more generally, which uh, really isn't any more general at all, um, we can take a tensor product uh, with some line bundle, get the action of same Heisenberg algebra on the direct sum of the cohomologies of rank one um, torsion free sheaves, uh, moduli spaces of rank one torsion free sheaves uh, with these specific um, churn characters. Um, and that's just because, you know, undertaking tensor product line bundle. Uh, this moduli space is isomorphic to the Hilbert scheme. Um, great. So this is, you know, M is moduli space of rank one uh, torsion free sheaves um, M one alpha alpha squared over two minus n is so isomorphic to Sn, um, I guess tensoring by one alpha inverse. Um, so in the case that S is an ADE surface, um, then if G hat is the corresponding affine Lie algebra, Um, this construction can be upgraded. So uh, the second cohomology of your surface is isomorphic to uh, the Cartan subalgebra, the corresponding finite dimensional Lie algebra. Um, and uh, G hat acts on the direct sum over all alpha um, of all of these uh, cohomologies and moduli spaces. Um, and really, actually, um, uh, we get a slightly larger algebra, uh, which is the direct sum of this G hat. Um, and because this G hat sort of only related to H2. Um, so we also get the Heisenberg algebra uh, based on uh, just H0 and H4. Um, and, you know, this 
acts on the same uh, space V. Um, so this, this construction can be done in uh, two equivalent ways. Um, so the first way um, is... Sam, this is, this is for now an AD surface, right? So it doesn't have H4, does it? Oh, that's right. Yeah, that, there's, there's no H4 here. Um, yeah. But well, it will be eventually. Yeah, there will be H4 in uh, the case that I care about. So uh, yeah, let's just get rid of get rid of H4. Um, so, uh, right. Um, right, so there's, there's kind of two ways to upgrade our Heisenberg algebra action to this G hat action. Um, the first way um, is called the frankel cost construction. Um, and uh, you know, the E I N uh, F I N, uh, which are, you know, the generators of G hat um, are just Fourier coefficients of uh, vertex operator algebra. Uh, I'm not going to write this down now because I'm going to do it later. Um, um, I guess of vertex operators. Um, right, so if we, um, you know, let this f h star of s um, denote the direct sum uh, then we can upgrade uh, this action uh, to, um, you know, this is the group algebra on the neuron severi group of your surface, which is just um, H2 of your surface in this case. Um, right, then, uh, you know, this is a vertex operator algebra um, and the Fourier coefficients give this upgrade. Um, Uh, and we're going to see this in detail later in the, um, I guess very soon in the case of the um, uh, K3 surface. Um, right, uh, so the second way um, is one that's really interesting because it, um, you know, it's more geometric, uh, lets us upgrade to, to quantum uh, affinization uh, actions as well. Um, Right, so there's, there's a general construction which gives a uh, Katsumuri uh, action on uh, Nakajima quiver varieties. Um, so uh, hopefully everybody that attended Andre's course should be pretty familiar with quiver varieties. Um, so I'm gonna assume that people have some, some sort of familiarity with them. Um, and the case that we care about is when the quiver um, Q, Q is um, affine ADE. Um, so for example, the um, most important one is going to be, uh, I guess this is a four hat, um, but you know, this affine, uh, Dn. Um, right, so if um, we fix uh, just a one dimensional framing uh, at the affine node, um, and then we fix a, a stability parameter um, to be, uh, you know, a, a Theta, so the real stability, uh, the complex stability parameters, so the one from the Hamiltonian introduction is zero. Um, the real stability parameter, which is the one for um, you know the GIT quotient, um, is uh, where all of your you know theta i are positive, um, 
and, and there's a sign convention, so they could also all be negative, but um, it sort of doesn't matter. Um, right, so, um, you know, you get an action of the corresponding uh, Katsumuri algebra on the direct sum over all dimension vectors um, of, actually, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't require any condition on W. Uh, for any uh, framing vector, uh, you take the direct sum over all dimension vectors, take all these um, smooth quiver varieties, um, and you get a uh, highest weight representation of the corresponding Katsumuri algebra, uh, where the Katsumuri algebra comes from the you know, uh, you know, data of the quiver itself. Um, the action on these spaces or their cohomologies? Sorry, yeah, that's, that's uh, action on the, um, yeah, the, the cohomologies of those spaces. Um, great. Uh, so, um, and, and this is also true for more general quivers, but the, the ones we care about are the affine ADE quivers. Um, and the reason is that, um, you know, there exists um, for every V, um, another stability parameter um, such that uh, M theta Hilda V, um, right, so now we take uh, uh, W to be W zero, where we just get a one dimensional framing at the affine node. Um, and uh, this particular quiver variety for this different stability parameter uh, is isomorphic to this moduli space of uh, rank one uh, torsion free sheaves um, for some correspondence between uh, you know, V and alpha N. Um, great, so, so we have this Katsumudi algebra action on quiver varieties for one stability parameter, um, but uh, two quiver varieties for the same uh, dimension and framing data and uh, different generic stability parameters um, are related to one another by flops. Um, so we get that the direct sum of all V of uh, the cohomology of M theta plus uh, VW zero uh, is actually isomorphic to the direct sum of uh, the cohomologies for uh, this other stability parameter uh, because uh, there's a flop that relates m theta plus vw. Uh, right, so this is a flop. Um, and M theta hild uh, VW. So it's a birational transformation, uh, which is in particular a diffeomorphism. Um, uh, and so you get an isomorphism between the cohomologies because it's a diff diffeomorphism, um, which means that you actually then get uh, the corresponding uh, Cuts Moody algebra action over here just by you know sort of conjugating with the flop. Um, so it's a fact that these two actions coincide. Um, great. So that's that's the background. Um, I hope a lot of people are pretty familiar. With, uh, and why do you um, emphasize? I thought you could construct the action independently of stability condition, and then say it's compatible with flops. Why? 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 Is that more important to you that you construct it this way or? Yeah, it's, it's important that I, um, so the, it, it'll sort of be clear, um, you know, th this particular stability parameter is the most natural for um, mm -hmm. constructing the specific correspondences that define the Lie algebra actions. Yeah, it is, um, yeah, it's. Mm, I don't know, I think it's a question of opinion. I think it constructs a. Okay. But, but anyhow, if you, how are your constructors compatible with flops? Uh, right. Okay. Um, great. So, um, 
now the um yeah so now now we're going to do sort of k3 surfaces um so uh you know the thing we should notice is that if you have s a k3 surface um then the neuron severi lattice of s uh looks a lot like um the Cartan subalgebra, sorry, the, um, right, yeah, it looks, uh, so, uh, it looks a lot like the root lattice. Um, you know, sometimes. Neuron severi lattice looks a lot like the root lattice of a Lorentzian cut smoothie algebra. Um, so, uh, some examples. Um, you know, all of the examples are going to be uh, elliptic K3s with sections. Sorry, what was NS? Uh, the neuron severi lattice, so it's the uh, equivalence class of uh, line bundles. It's, um, yeah, so NS of your surface um, is pick of your surface modulo uh, pick zero, which is trivial uh, if pi okay. one of s is zero, uh, which means, you know, it's just pick of s. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, it's a lattice um, uh, in H2, um, sub-lattice of H2 uh, given by the churn character of the line bundle. Um, great. Uh, so, Right, so our examples are going to be elliptic K3 surfaces with sections. Um, so let's say we have an elliptic K3 surface with um, a section, which is a, a smooth rational curve, and maybe one fiber where your elliptic fiber uh, degenerates um, into, uh, well, it looks a lot like the, um, the dual graph of the Dinkin diagram of an affine um, a and Lie algebra. Um, so, yeah, dual graph. Um, so this looks a lot like uh, an extended affine uh, Dinkin diagram. Um, right, so this is, you know, A and something like this. Uh, and you can do this for n less than or equal to 19. Um, so you don't get all, uh, you know, possible Lorentzian cut smoothie algebras. Uh, and you can do other things. So, um, you know, now I'm just going to draw the dual graph. Uh, you can take um, like a affine dn, um, and extend it by adding an extra node. Um, wherever the corresponding uh, like label is uh, one, so you can like label the nodes of an affine Dinkin diagram by like where the, um, the null root, what its components are. Um, and wherever you have a one, uh, you can sort of have a section there because sort of the multiplicity of that component um, of rational curves in the elliptic fiber is just one, so a section can pass through with intersection one. Um, but in any case, there's, there's a lot of um, Lorentzian Katsumudi algebras uh, such that their, you know, the intersection pairing on the root lattice looks like the neuron severi lattice of a K3 surface. Um, so other examples, um, you know, a lot of the um, K3s uh, with um, finite uh, symplectic automorphism group.
um, show up as elliptic K3s with some numbers of singular sections. Um, and this construction also works if you have several um, uh, singular, sorry, singular fibers. You can have several singular fibers. All, all that has to happen is the um, uh, curves in the fibers have to meet transversely. So, um, right. Uh, so you can have something like, um, uh, you know, maybe one fiber like this, um, another fiber. Yeah, I guess that's fine. Um, right, but, and, and I get also some other sections as well. So you can get a wide variety of these and all these K3s that show up with finite automorphism group um, that are related to moonshine. Um, uh, this construction should be relevant for those. Um, right, so, um, and again, there's, there's two ways to produce this construction of um, a Lie algebra action. Um, so let V denote the direct sum um, over alpha, direct sum n greater than or equal to zero of m. So I'm going to change notation a little bit. Um, so this is the same thing as uh, previous um, m1 alpha alpha squared over 2 minus n. Um, you know, we're replacing the churn character of a sheaf uh, with its churn character times the square root of the Todd genus of the surface. This is called the, the Mackay vector. Uh, it turns out to be more natural for duality reasons. Um, uh, great. So uh, then um, theorem, um, there exists, uh, you know, a GS hat, which I'll define shortly, take the direct sum with the Heisenberg algebra generated by H0 and H4. Um, and it acts on this space V. Um, and this can be done in two different ways. Um, right, so the first way uh, is just do um, the Actually, I guess this is uh, supposed to be a, um, a much larger Heisenberg algebra. Um, right, so it's actually H0 direct sum H4. Um, yeah, so this is H0 uh, direct sum H4 uh, direct sum the transcendental lattice of the surface. So this is kind of like the uh, orthogonal complement of the neuron severi lattice um, in the cohomology of your surface. Uh, so you get a sort of big Heisenberg algebra uh, and it commutes with this um, uh, other Lie algebra um, and it acts on V. Um, right, so there's two different ways. There's one that's uh, kind of purely representation theoretic um, and it's just to do the same thing with Frank Lucas. Um, so, uh, you have the, um, you know, the Heisenberg algebra of, uh, yeah, let's just do the neuron severe lattice of your surface, um, is going to be generated by, uh, some alpha N, um, and a C alpha is in um, neuron severi, um, and is an integer. Um, so you just define the vertex operator, um, and, um, you know, it's normal ordered product of alpha zero log z plus, um, 
uh, sorry, that should just be alpha, not alpha to zero. Um, and then, right, this is the direct sum over alpha of n over negative n, z to the negative n, n is not zero. Um, and then you just expand this out. Um, and you define its uh, Fourier coefficients. Um, and if you do this, then, um, you know, there are formulas for whenever you have an, yeah, this works for any even lattice. So this is just the um, uh, vertex operator algebra associated to even lattice. And then you take, you know, these generators and um, uh, the, so the, the Xn alpha um, for alpha corresponding to uh, irreducible minus two curve um, these span um, a Lie algebra um, which as a vector space um, is this sort of affinization of the Lorentzian cuts Moody algebra um, based on the um, you know Dinkin diagram coming from your surface. Um, so this is G S hat, uh, where G S is um, the cuts Moody algebra from um, the you know the well the Carton matrix is the um, you take um, C1 up to Cn, and these are minus two curves. Um, so you get, uh, well, it's the negative of the sort of geometric pairing. Uh, and then you just get ones and zeros around here. Um, and it's a fact that whenever you have this sort of structure, uh, then the um, Fourier coefficients of these vertex operators uh, span an algebra like this, um, where the commutation relation um, is the, the same as going from a finite dimensional um, uh, you know, semi-simple Lie algebra to the corresponding affine Lie algebra. Um, great. Uh, so then the second way to construct an action of the same algebra um, comes from um, the birational geometry, I guess the k-trivial uh, birational geometry. I, I missed a point about the, uh, the, the previous part. Can you always put your algebra into something which has this minus two on the diagonal? So it's a, or is, it, is this an assumption or is it? A... Yeah, this is an assumption on the K3 surface that um, the neuron severi lattice is spanned by minus two curves um, where uh, they intersect transversely. So you get minus twos in the diagonal and ones other places. There, there are plenty of K3 surfaces that don't have this property. Um, I, I previously actually thought, uh, and we've had some discussions about this before, there's, there's an issue when your K3 surface actually is generated by um, uh, uh, you know, some positive classes. Um, I thought that you could get a Borchard's cuts Moody algebra action, um, but I think the only way to do that is actually to deform to the case where um, it looks like this and then uh, use uh, this algebra and you know, fit a Borchard's cuts Moody algebra inside of here. So, uh, right, so that was my question. Is that a geometric fact that every every K3 surface could be deformed to this? Right, so um, it's, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll erase this and sort of answer those questions because it's actually important for applications to like the quantum cohomology of Hilbert schemes of points on K3 surfaces. Uh, so every, um, right, so pick um, some uh, K3 surface S uh, and a class 
um, you know, algebraic class uh, gamma, uh, which is in H11 of S. Um, so gamma squared um, is even, um, you know, 2g minus 2 um, for g uh, greater than or equal to 0. Uh, so it's not true that any K3 surface, the entire lattice deforms into something of this form. Uh, for that, I mean, the, um, the H2 of the K3 um, you know, looks kind of like this, but then you also have some, some uh, zeros along the diagonal. Uh, but it's true that if you pick any class, um, then uh, if you take S such that um, the pairing on uh, NS has the form uh, this, um, then you can write, uh, so this is a K3 surface with um, a uh, section and a fiber, uh, but you know, no sing, I mean, it has singular fibers, but no singular fibers that are the union of smooth rational curves. Um, so this is your fiber and that's your section. Um, then uh, there is a deformation uh, fixing the class uh, gamma um, to S and then, um, right, I think what you take is the section plus um, G times the fiber. Um, maybe that's not actually the right number. Uh, but there's a, a deformation where you uh, keep this class an algebraic class and you can deform to uh, an elliptic history of the fiber. Um, so, uh, and then what you would do is, uh, so this is, this is standard. Sometimes this is called a, a Brian Lung um, uh, K3 surface because of the enumerative geometry applications of this construction. Uh, but then what you can do is you can take um, this elliptic K3 um, and deform it to one uh, where uh, that fiber breaks into a, um, I think this is called a fiber of type I3. Um, but in any case, this has uh, intersection pairing minus two, minus two, uh, minus two, minus two, and then uh, ones here. Uh, so if you take any algebraic class on your surface, you can deform uh, the surface in such a way that that class runs algebraic um, to uh, a K3 surface of this form. Um, so, uh, you know, you can't keep the entire neuron severe lattice, but say if, if you care about, you know, quantum cohomology, uh, in some sense, this is good enough. Um, great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sort of the... Um, so uh, maybe okay. to summarize, what, what are the Cs that can appear in, that in this, uh, these Cartan matrices that can appear as intersection patterns? Um, that you allow. So. Yeah, so, so they have to uh, be spanned. The, so the neuron severe lattice, I'll, I'll write down the co condition precisely. So condition, um, the neuron severe lattice of S um, must be uh, spanned uh, by smooth rational curves. Uh, you know, which means that they're uh, minus two curves. Um, and uh, we also require that any pair of these um, intersects transversely at one point. So it's kind of like a simply laced condition. Um, great. So then the, the previous construction works here uh, because this, these conditions are exactly what are required for the 
commutation relations between uh, Fourier coefficients of vertex operators to give you this algebra. Um, I mean, there's probably more general things that can be said, but this is, um, you know, a, a natural condition to make things work very nicely. Um, great. So, um, right. So then what's, what's the second way to construct the action of this algebra? So the one is just purely... Sorry, one more question. You previously had some construction where you allowed zeros on the diagonals. Are this no longer in, in play or they somehow... This is actually a really interesting question. So um, uh, what happens then is that, uh, you, you know, so at first I thought I, I misread the, uh, how you actually calculated the commutation relations between um, Fourier coefficients. So uh, when you do this, um, actually more things commute than you would expect if you were to get a Borchardt's Katsumudi algebra. So you get like a, a larger commutative subalgebra. Uh, and I think this is related in some ways to uh, what's called the Beauville integrable system, uh, where you get like a Lagrangian fibration. Because these zero classes also correspond exactly to like elliptic fibrations. And um, this is interesting, but I'm not sure I fully understand the story yet. Um, but right now, yeah, we're not allowing uh, generators which are zero classes. We're going to uh, always deform in such a way that these break into. Um, uh, you know, a union of minus two curves. Um, great, uh, but the, I mean, the, there is like a zero class here, right? So then the, uh, there's a, uh, this fiber here breaks into a union of smooth rational curves, but if you take the class that's the sum of those rational curves, you still get, um, you know, a null class. So this is still like an elliptic surface. You, um, uh, so you're still allowed, uh, Zero curves, but not as generators. Um, uh, great. Um, so, yeah. Now I'm going to move on to the the sort of second construction of this action uh, given by variation of bridge of instability conditions. Um, right. So, um, and the k-trivial uh, birational geometry. Um, of uh, Hilbert schemes of points on a K3 surface um, is controlled by a variation of bridge line stability. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to write um, uh, generators um, for uh, G hat S um, as, um, you know, Steinberg type correspondences between different moduli spaces of bridgeland stable objects. Um, and along the way, um, uh, you know, sort of as a, a corollary, uh, for some um, affine uh, ADE quivers, uh, a new, actually, I'm not 100% sure this is new, but I, I kind of hope it's new, a new geometric um, modular interpretation of um, M theta V and W zero um, for any generic theta. Just as um, uh, the restriction to a, a poly disk um, of Bridgeland stable complexes on the K3 surface. So like a, a neighborhood of um, one of these singular loci uh, or 
potential singular loci, so contractible collections of minus two curves that correspond to, you know, ADE surfaces. Um, if you restrict a complex to a, um, uh, an open set of this, you get a, a modular interpretation of some of these quiver varieties um, that I haven't seen in the literature. Um, great. Uh, so um, let's see, how am I doing on time? I've got uh, 50 minutes left, great. Um, so uh, before I actually talk about the birational geometry of Hilbert schemes of points on K3 surfaces and um, how this is controlled by bridge instability, uh, I want to review the case of quiver varieties where it's a little bit simpler. Um, and, um, you know, many of the same uh, phenomena show up. Um, right, so it's a theorem um, that um, the variation of uh, GIT stability um, completely controls um, the birational, the I guess K trivial um, Birational geometry of, uh, let's say, s to the n over sim n of the uh, blown down surface, where s is, um, you know, you take the, the resolution of this. Um, so, uh, the, the relation between these two uh, uh, is actually kind of strange. So there's, there's um, a lot more information in uh, variation of GIT stability um, and uh, sort of drawing out the birational geometry from this is actually uh, kind of an interesting, uh, interesting problem. Um, so uh, I'm mostly just gonna do examples, um, but the, you know, the, general phenomena are, um, you know, similar to these examples. Um, so let's take um, a um, A2 affine quiver. Um, uh, where we again choose a, a one dimensional framing uh, uh, vector only at the affine node, which in this case we can choose to be whatever because of symmetry, but uh, in general, you can't. Um, and so, uh, you know, here, delta is just 1, 1, 1, uh, which is, um, you know, the null uh, root. Um, and if you take uh, v to be n delta, uh, this corresponds to, um, you know, m 1 alpha uh, alpha squared over two minus n um, is just just actually the Hilbert scheme of n points. Um, right. So um, in this case, um, well, actually, um, you know, this is. Um, uh, I'm going to state a general statement. Um, the walls. Um, in the stability space, so this is the space of uh, stability parameters theta, um, which is isomorphic to H2 um, of your surface. Um, let's take rational coefficients. Um, and, you know, I guess technically now this requires n to be um, greater than one, uh, but you know an analogous statement holds just by taking a quotient um, to uh, the um, the Cartan subalgebra of the affine P algebra. Um, so these walls are given exactly by uh, delta perp. And um, 
K, sorry, it's the walls which, which induce birational contractions. Um, are given by delta and k delta plus alpha perp, where um, zero is less than or equal to k is less than or equal to n, um, and alpha is in the uh, corresponding finite dimensional root system. Um, so in particular, um, there are many cases where there are walls for GIT stability, um, which don't actually induce birational contractions. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna draw pictures in just one second. But the um, the image of a stability vector, um, you know, is an ample class. So um, you can kind of partition H two of a surface into um, the, well, I guess the positive cone, um, but it's, a, I guess, a little bit different here for um, uh, non-compact uh, surfaces. Um, unfortunately, yeah, most of the terminology that I'm familiar with is for uh, compact surfaces. So um, uh, in any case, you can still, here you can actually partition um, H2 entirely into a union of ample cones for the corresponding birational models. Um, so the image of a stability vector um, under, uh, you know, this isomorphism um, is uh, an ample class on the corresponding um, uh, birational model. Um, great, so now I'm gonna draw some pictures. Um, so let's take um, n is equal to two. Um, then uh, the Stability space, um, right? So here we have an A2 surface, um, and there's sort of one extra direction um, for uh, you know the the class of um, moving double points to give um, H2 of S n is uh, three dimensional. Um, and you know, there's a wall and chamber structure, which is equivalently given by uh, chambers corresponding to different birational models, um, or you know, specific unions of GIT stability parameters. Um, so um, there are walls that uh, correspond to. So this is delta perp. Um, so classes on delta perp correspond to um, classes where the um, divisor of um, you know moving double points gets contracted, um, and uh, there's also uh, you know alpha one perp, um, alpha two perp, um, and um, but then there's other uh, walls. Um, so for example, um, here, I'll, I'll draw this in a different color. Um, there's a wall here, um, which corresponds to um, alpha zero perp, which is delta minus alpha one minus alpha two perp. Um, and then, uh, so this positive chamber um, where uh, the pairing of your stability parameter with alpha zero, alpha one, and alpha two um, is uh, exactly this sort of fundamental cone for 
the affine rail group action um, on this um, sort of three-dimensional space. Um, right, and then there, there are a few other walls. Um, so uh, luckily I actually have uh, some pictures. Um, so um, now what I'm gonna do, the pictures that I'm gonna show are just going to be kind of like a, a slice of this picture. So um, this is sort of like a, um, a usual way of drawing pictures of um, you know, chambers for affine reflection groups is they actually act on sort of fans in a one higher dimensional space, but you take a slice that um, intersects um, you know, the cones that are in some half plane you know, the same sort of picture shows up on the other side. Um, so uh, you don't really lose any information just by looking at the slice. Um, so let's see. All right, here's one picture. Um, here's another picture. Um, right, so um, this is for uh, this one down here is for dimension vector 333. So this corresponds to um, S3. Um, so you can see um, these red walls, um, you know, this is alpha 1 perp, this is alpha 2 perp, um, this is alpha 1 plus alpha 2 perp. Um, this here is alpha zero perp. Um, so the Hilbert scheme chamber um, is over here. Um, and then, you know, theta plus lies here. Here you have the Hilbert scheme chamber. Uh, and uh, here you have theta plus. Um, but the, um, uh, so for example, uh, for the dimension vector 333, um, the, the red walls correspond to walls where there are divisorial contractions and the blue walls correspond to lower dimensional, um, uh, you know, birational transformations. Uh, but you get sort of something different for the um, case of, um, uh, oh, where did my, this is dimension vector um, four, three, three. Um, the divisorial walls here are the ones that intersect this um, green point. Um, so you actually kind of get a shift um, in GIT stability that corresponds to um, in the in the correspondence between uh, birational chambers and uh, GIT chambers. So. Um, Right, so uh, I'm going to draw a purple dot on all the walls in the top picture that actually induce birational contractions. Uh, the other ones actually don't. So all of these walls induce birational contractions. Um, right, so there's two on either side of the divisorial lines. Uh, and then, for example, um, you know, this wall and this wall. Um, don't induce contractions. Um, so uh, let's take theta zero here. Um, then, uh, and you know, theta plus over here. Uh, so the map, um, you know, pi theta plus to theta zero, uh, which goes from moduli space of quiver representations for theta plus uh, to moduli space of uh, quiver representations for theta zero. Um, this map is um, one, it's not surjective. Uh, so there are uh, more uh, quiver representations uh, you know, there's a higher dimensional space of quiver representations for the non-generic stability parameter. Uh, but the other fact is that it's an isomorphism um, 
onto uh, its image. Um, right, so there's this kind of strange interplay between uh, GIT stability um, and uh, birational geometry that uh, everything you could want to know about the birational geometry in principle comes from variation of GIT stability, but it's actually a, a little bit difficult to, uh, to read it off. Um, so uh, in this case, we actually, uh, you know, we can say what happens, but in, in general, it's actually somewhat difficult. So a lot of strange behaviors. So for example, you know, these maps that send quiver representations to, uh, you know, their um, uh, representatives for less generic uh, stability parameters, this might not be surjective. Um, it might be an isomorphism. It might uh, not be an isomorphism and also not be surjective. So there's this kind of strange phenomena that happen. Um, but in any case, all the information is, you know, in principle there. Um, and um, right, the other thing that I want from this picture, um, I guess I'll put these images up again, um, is that uh, the Hecke correspondence um, PI um, uh, which is uh, an element of um, I guess I'm going to do Borel Moore homology but this sort of doesn't matter um, theta plus VW0 cross M theta plus V plus rho IW um, which gives you the action of EI and FI um, in the corresponding cuts Moody algebra. Um, uh, so how does this arise? Because we're going to generalize this to the case of um, uh, K3 surfaces and bridge and stable objects there. Um, so this arises, um, you know, uh, I guess Andre has a, a maybe different perspective. Um, but for me, this arises, so you start in this chamber, uh, you go over to um, the corresponding wall of the theta plus chamber, um, and um, you, know, you go back into the theta plus chamber. So um, PI um, is actually, so it's usually stated as lying above the, um, you know, the affine quotient for stability parameter theta is equal to zero. Um, but it turns out to actually be um, in uh, the cohomology where you only um, have to uh, generically hit one wall. Um, so the, the theta is equal to zero case is kind of like a very degenerate um, uh, stability condition where the birational geometry is kind of harder to understand. But when you only generically hit one wall, uh, it's actually pretty easy to understand the birational geometry. Uh, so for us, we're actually going to take the Hecke correspondence um, is sitting inside, um, uh, that should be down here, uh, the moduli space of quiver representations for um, a kind of uh, generically non-generic uh, stability uh, parameter. Um, and uh, right, so this is a specific correspondence and then convolution, um, you know, convolution with um, the PI uh, gives the action um, of EI and then, uh, you know, FI if you go the other direction up to a sign. Um, so this is sort of the, the central object for um, you know, representation theory in this way. Um, right, and um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of find an analogous correspondence between modular spaces of bridge unstable objects that we can use sort of this um, uh, local description um, in order to show that it satisfies certain relations. Um, so it's actually a very general phenomenon. Um, 
uh, that you know the local structure um, of you know generally like you know modular um, uh, birational contractions uh, is given um, uh, it's all um, or local or analytically um, uh, by a um, map of a quiver variety uh, for some Q, some uh, dimension and framing uh, to the corresponding affine quotient. Um, so, uh, I mean, the key example um, is, you know, this is true for um, M theta VW to M theta zero VW. Uh, so if you want to understand the uh, structure of the map from a, you know, generic stability parameter to a non-generic stability parameter for, you know, a quiver variety, um, then uh, all you have to do is understand the um, structure for a stability parameter to the zero stability parameter for a different quiver variety. Um, so, I mean, the implication of this is that um, uh, generically, um, you know, this map um, uh, has sort of local quiver, um, so generically meaning uh, theta zero is um, generically non-generic. Um, so it just lies on one wall. Um, then uh, this map um, locally looks like um, M uh, theta VW to M zero VW, um, you know, maybe times some, uh, you know, just flat space uh, for um, uh, Q um, is just a quiver with um, uh, one dimension vector, uh, you know, dim dimension space one and uh, uh, I guess then that can also be a framing, um, which, uh, right, so this is uh, the corresponding quiver varieties then are just cotangent bundles to Grassmannians. Um, and then... Don't you uh, get some loops there in, in principle? Yeah, so you can get, you can get loops. Um, so for us, we're only actually dealing with real roots. So yeah, there, there, there can be loops. Uh, I, I'm capturing the loops at the framing vertex by this um, CK over here. So there's sort of K loops at the framing vertex that I'm not drawing. Um, and uh, yeah, really, so these are only walls where you hit um, kind of real roots. Um, they're actually just um, Grassmannians. So yeah, there's, there's actually an additional condition, which is that um, theta is generically on um, but then going going back to this question I asked previously, so if you have a if you had a vector with a zero norm, you would expect to have a local model where you have one loop at that vertex. Uh, yeah, that's right. You can get you can get loops at the vertex if you have zero norm. Um, so yeah, so non generic on alpha perp, so that um, you know uh, alpha squared is two. Um, right. So you you just get um, you know. Uh, map from a uh, Grassmannian to a uh, nilpotent orbit closure. Uh, which is, you know, just the Springer um, uh, resolution uh, for uh, maximal parabolic. Um, right, uh, so, you know, maps that are locally of this form um, you know, I have some names, I guess. Um, uh, but one of the names is uh, um, 
a stratified Mukai flop. Um, and uh, what's really nice about them is that, um, you know, you know exactly um, the cycle uh, gamma, which induces uh, you know, the isomorphism between uh, the uh, cohomologies of M uh, and M dual, uh, sorry, for and some other M prime, um, where, uh, you know, M prime corresponds to you, uh, you're on the other side of the wall, so you're, uh, you kind of have the, the dual Grassmannian uh, with the same base. So locally, you have like a, a Grassmannian bundle over some base, and then you, uh, you know, blow this down, blow up the Grassmannian the dual bundle. You know, you can show they exist. And the nice thing is that you know exactly what, uh, you know, graph closure correspondence in some deformation is that gives the um, uh, corresponding isomorphism, uh, even when the base is non-trivial. So, um, uh, right. So this is a, a key fact that's important is that, you know, I, uh, if I know something is a stratified Mackay flop, then I can say, uh, I can identify components exactly in the um, uh, corresponding, um, you know, fiber product over the base. Um, and so I'm going to, you know, use one of these and pick it out, and that's going to be my sort of analog of the HECA correspondence for producing a section. Um, you know, there's many more examples where qu quivers give local descriptions of, um, uh, you know, m moduli spaces of some objects that can break into direct sums or things. And it's, um, you know, uh, Arborello Saka does this for pure rank one sheaves on K3 surfaces. And then, you know, there's this relation with moduli spaces of sheaves on Clavio three folds, where it's like given by a quiver with some potential and it's like a derived critical locus. And it's, uh, you know, an important and very general story. Um, right, so what about K3 surfaces? So Bridgeland, um, um, on K3 surfaces. Um, how much am I on time? All right, so um, I'm actually, I'm not gonna state a formal definition of a Bridgeland stability condition, um, but, um, you know, idea, I'll give the rough idea. Um, so, a uh, Bridgeland stability condition sigma, um, you know, in uh, the space of stability conditions on um, the bounded derived category of coherent sheaves on uh, S K three, or you know, in general, um, in the space of stability conditions for any triangulated category. Um, you know, these are very hard to construct, uh, but you have a complete description of one component of the space for uh, K3 surfaces. Um, so, uh, you know, we're only gonna do this case. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the ideas are the same. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's one uh, sort of key piece of data, which is the central charge. Um, um, and uh, generally, we can take this uh, as taking a object in the bounded derived category of the surface, sending it to uh, its central charge, uh, which is the uh, Mukai pairing of e to the beta plus i, I omega uh, with the Mukai vector of e. Um, so uh, this is by definition um, e to the beta plus i omega times the churn character of e times the square root of the uh, Todd genus of your surface. Um, and, uh, you know, this is important because, you know, if you have, um, 
you know, an F uh, and an E, uh, then their pairing by the herzberg riemann roch theorem is the negative of the Euler characteristic of the dual of F uh, tensored with E, um, which is exactly why you do this kind of square to the Todd genus thing. Um, right, so this is a function on the, um, a complex valued function on the numerical Grothendieck group of your surface. Um, and, uh, but you actually get something more. Um, so the, the whole picture you get um, is you get some set of stable objects, uh, which is gonna, you know, be derived from, you know, a stability condition whose formal definition I'm not stating. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of theorems that say if you have like part of this data, then you can recover the rest of it um, and, you know, different parts. Um, so um, stable objects, uh, they do get maps to the uh, numerical growth and dike group of your surface, which here is just, um, you know, H, it's isomorphic to H0, direct sum H11, direct sum H4. Um, and you get this map on any elements of the numerical growth index group, not just ones corresponding to stable objects. Uh, you get a map from here to the complex plane minus the origin. Um, let's see. Uh, I think I actually need more space for this picture. So. All right, so, uh, so this is what you get for, you know, every object has a central charge. Um, for stable objects, uh, this actually factors um, through um, the, uh, right, so this is C minus the origin, and then you take its universal of cover. Um, and you get a map that sends any stable object to a point here. Um, and, um, you know, the, the, so these uh, have to project down onto their corresponding central charges. Um, and uh, between stable objects, there are um, no maps that go uh, this direction. So if you have two stable objects, and uh, their uh, sort of phases around this, you know, infinite tower of the complex plane uh, are, you know, one is further than the other. Then, um, you know, they're they're you're not allowed to have maps that go sort of downwards on the corkscrew. Um, right, and then uh, this fact that it factors through the uh, numerical uh, growth and group means that if you um, shift by one. This corresponds to a, a half turn uh, because its E goes to negative E in the growth and group. Um, maybe that minus sign, minus sign should be on the outside of. Um, uh, right. So, um, and then the the sort of key fact is that as the stability condition changes. And um, you know the the phases of objects overlap with one another. Uh, then you can uh, get contractions in uh, moduli spaces of stable objects. Um, so, for example, um, let's say you have you know the moduli space um, of stable objects parametrizing um, objects of this Mukai vector. Um, so this corresponds to um, Sn for some sigma. Um, but if, um, you know, sigma crosses a wall um, where the phase of um, the ideal sheaf overlaps with the phase of the, um, you know, structure sheaf of your surface, then um, well, we do actually have maps from um, OS to IY, 
Um, but uh, as we cross this wall, this no longer becomes allowed between maps between stable objects, which means that um, you know this exact triangle uh, in the derived category destabilizes your ideal sheaf. And so um, on the other side of the wall, um, uh, you actually have that I of Y um, is, uh, you know, maybe this is, um, uh, let's say all of our points are separate, although, although I guess it doesn't, well, we really don't want it to be separate. So I'm going to call this um, the structure sheaf of Y. So we're saying, what's the map from the structure sheaf to the ideal? Oh, that's the other way, isn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's the other way. Yeah, my sequence is wrong. So it goes, um, the ideal sheaf to the structure sheaf, uh, and then you get, um, uh, you know, the shift of a Y. Because this corresponds to like, you know, the, the usual exact sequence of the ideal sheaf and the structure sheaf of points, but then you have an exact triangle where you shift it by one. Um, you know, let's say the, the length of Y is N corresponding to this Mackay vector. Um, then um, the, ideal sheaf of y is s equivalent to o s direct sum um, meaning all of its stable factors you can another piece of bridge and stability condition is you can break any object up into like a sum of stable objects so that this the sum sort of factors through the stability condition the central charge so the central charge is additive so if you have like a direct sum or some extension then uh, this factors through the numerical growth index group and um, right so uh, this is S equivalent to OS direct sum of IY, uh, but then uh, this is also S equivalent to um, uh, OS direct sum um, over, uh, uh, you know, the direct sum over all those points. Uh, so this contraction, um, you know, on the other side of the wall, we have uh, sigma prime. Uh, or let's say on the wall. Um, yeah, so on, on the other side of the wall, we get sort of a derived dual. So on um, the wall, uh, you know, let's say we have sigma zero on the wall. Uh, the map uh, sending a sheaf or an object to its uh, S equivalence class um, is exactly, um, the um, Hilbert Chow map um, sending an ideal sheaf to its support. Um, right. Uh, so, um, you know, hopefully that was like a um, brief but thorough enough introduction to what st Bridgeland stability conditions are. Um, the, I mean, the key theorem in this area. Um, of the relation between bridge lens stability and moduli spaces of sheaves um, or more generally stable objects on K3 surfaces, uh, which is due to uh, Bayer and McCree. Um, I think this is like 012. There's two papers. Maybe one is like 09, the other is 012. Or, um, well, uh, you know, whatever it is, so the, the the k-trivial birational geometry um, um, of uh, any m sigma for some Mackay vector, um, e.g. the Hilbert scheme of points, um, is controlled by a map um, which goes from uh, stability conditions on your surface um, to uh, the positive cone um, of uh, M sigma V. Um, so the positive cone is inside H2 of M sigma V um, and uh, there's actually a, a bilinear form on H2 um, uh, 
so in some sense, these, uh, you know, hyperkähler varieties act like surfaces in the sense that their uh, middle dimension, that their two dimensional cohomology, you know, has this pairing kind of like the Nernst very pairing and it, uh, you know, controls everything about the birational geometry of the surface. Um, and uh, that form is called the Bogo, um, Bogomolov form. Um, right, so then the, so you get a map from the space stability conditions to, you know, this positive cone um, in uh, such a way that um, the uh, image of a stability chamber Um, is exactly uh, the ample cone of the corresponding birational model. So what you do is you like pick some base sigma, generic sigma, um, you know, here um, V is, has to be primitive uh, so that we have a smooth, um, Uh, M sigma V for sigma generic. Uh, and then what we do is we pick a, f a base sigma um, and then consider that to be like our H2. Um, and um, then uh, all of the other chambers correspond to different sigmas. And every K, K trivial birational model is given by one of these chambers. Um, which is also the image of a chamber of the space of stability conditions. So I have some pictures of this for um, the Hilbert schemes of points on K3 surface. Um, so I'll make this one big. Uh, right, so this is, um, you know, positive cone of S2 um, where S has this intersection pairing O minus one, minus one, two. Um, so uh, one thing that you should notice is that um, nearby this point, um, this looks uh, a little bit like the um, wall and chamber structure for an A1 quiver variety um, uh, with uh, yeah, so it looks like the wall and chamber structure in the stability space for a uh, quiver variety with, um, you know, two nodes and two edges going between them. Um, and uh, this turns out not to be a coincidence. Um, and then it's also true for um, uh, higher numbers of points. Um, and for, I mean, this is, uh, you know, if you tensor by a line bundle, clearly the birational geometry is the same. So you get also these walls. So I'm gonna show a few more pictures. So I'll put this one back up. Um, here it is for four points. Um, I think that's seven points and that's 13 points. So, um, you know, as you go up in the number of points, the- Did you draw those or you stole them from somebody or? No, I, I produced them, it's Sage code. Oh, that's that, beautiful. Um, yeah, so the, um, I mean, I can't produce any number of points, but I, you know, these aren't actually the pictures because I can't draw an infinite number of lines. So, the, you know, you go further out, there's more and more walls. But um, uh, in any case, right? So, what I care about entirely is, uh, well, not entirely, but you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of other interesting behavior in these pictures. But um, you know, what I care about right now, and for the purpose of this talk, is near this point, uh, which corresponds to. Uh, you take sim n of blowing down the elliptic section. So you blow down a, a S2. And so you can also, you know, deform this and you get like a, you know, this same picture shows up whenever you have uh, any rational curve on a K3 surface. And the more points you get, the more wells you get, uh, just like for a quiver variety. Um, great. So I only have a few minutes left. Um, but, um, I mean, the key thing is if we take, um, you know, if we take uh, a region um, U in uh, stab dagger of S uh, such that um, 
it's in a certain limit where uh, the volume of the uh, K3 surface and therefore also the moduli space of stable complexes tends to infinity. Um, but um, you also require that uh, beta dot omega um, remains bounded. Um, so this implies in particular that the exceptional locus of the Hilbert Chow map remains really small. So the exceptional divisor is almost being contracted, um, meaning that we're very close to this wall here. Um, and then you also require that um, if you take some curve CI uh, and pair it with omega, um, this has to be extremely small. So this has to be less than some bound over the volume of the surface. Um, so in this limit, um, you know, uh, we can't take ci dot omega to just be bounded by like epsilon or something because as uh, omega gets larger and larger, uh, you tend back towards just the Hilbert scheme of points. You need to, in this limit, which you need to take to avoid the influence of, you know, all sorts of other like spherical objects and things, uh, you need to take this limit where the surface of your, um, the volume of the surface gets extremely large and the volume of uh, contractible curves you know, a specific collection of contractible curves um, uh, um, gets really, really small. Um, and then, uh, you know, all of these maps, you know, locally look like the corresponding maps to the quiver variety, uh, which is uh, pretty easy to show in this case because, um, uh, you know, really your surface looks just locally like an ADE surface. And then there are also uh, stratified Mackay flops, so you know exactly the graph correspondence and you can pick out an appropriate um, uh, component of that correspondence and locally calculate that it's, uh, it satisfies the relations required for the, uh, uh, you know, algebra action that I want. Um, and so what this does is this gives us, um, you know, a, affine Lie algebra action um, at each corner um, corresponding to um, a contractible um, uh, ADE collection. Um, so that's, that's one piece. So this is like, a, so this, technically isn't one of the surfaces which is allowed by the condition because the smallest one uh, has near and severity rank uh, four, I guess. Um, but, you know, similar behavior holds if you only have like a, a minus two curve and you can still get an affine SL2 action, for instance. So at this corner, um, you get um, like a, an action of, um, you know, say affine A2. Um, and then at this corner, you get an action of like a affine A1 cross A1. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's some walls and locally it just looks like the walls for the corresponding quiver case. Um, and so this, you know, you get an action of affine uh, A2 on the, you know, uh, direct sum, um, I guess I'll draw this down here, uh, on the direct sum of um, overall alpha um, and, you know, direct sum of all N um, on the cohomologies of uh, some specific sigma plus um, of V, which comes from alpha N, you know, it's just the same one alpha alpha squared over two minus N. Um, and then we also get, um, you know, this is G affine A1 cross A1. Um, right, so we also get this action. Um, and then the, the key step of the proof, I guess, is then to show that, um, you know, the corresponding pieces coincide because you can just, you know, 
do a simple argument that says that if you have all of these actions and the corresponding EIs and FIs coincide, um, then you get an action of this algebra that's generated by all of these. Um, and then, um, right, so, uh, you know, this kind of boils down to just, a, um, again, just a local quiver variety uh, calculations. What you need to show is that, um, you know, you have, here's one um, sigma plus, um, and here's sigma plus prime, um, you know, then you also have sigma zero and sigma zero prime, uh, and then you have, uh, you know, some uh, stability condition in the Hilbert scheme chamber, um, and um, uh, Hild zero, I guess. Uh, then all, really all you need to show is that if you get, you know, some uh, PI, which is a correspondence between uh, um, uh, moduli spaces for different Mackay vectors, and, you know, there's some, you know, there, there isn't actually a definition for moduli spaces for, uh, you know, non-generic bridge instability conditions uh, in general, but there's a way around this in this case just by, you know, looking at some nice stratification. Um, and, uh, you know, this wasn't an issue for quiver varieties because it's just defined, but, um, you know, and you have some PI tilde over here, um, you know, essentially you just need to show that um, if you take some sort of flop and compose it with PI of V, um, then this is equal to uh, PI tilde of V um, composed with another flop. Um, and uh, you can do this just by crossing um, uh, these loci um, where uh, the fact that, um, you know, PI agrees with um, PI, um, you know, one. So this is true, uh, you know, the action induced by PI uh, is equivalent to the action induced by PI one uh, because um, locally we just have, um, you know, finite uh, A2 quiver uh, actions um, and the flop intertwines um, uh, G A2. So we can locally calculate that uh, this PI uh, gives the same thing as this and then go one wall over and over and over uh, to show that, you know, this is equivalent to that and that's equivalent to that just by computing locally that the difference between the cycles are zero. Um, and the fact that locally, uh, this is just, um, you know, EI or FI for a finite um, A2 quiver. And this shows that the actions coincide and then it's just, you know, these are defining generators and relations for my algebra. Uh, all right, uh, I guess that's the end of my talk. Does anybody have questions? Yeah, you mentioned some possible applications to the quantum cohomology of Hilbert schemes. Right, yeah. So um, I guess a, a sort of, <laughs> um, you know, a, a conjecture along these lines. Um, right, so um, that, uh, I mean, really the hope is just to, uh, that the formula is the same as the uh, formula of Malik and Okunkov, that, um, you know, the first churn class um, of some tautological bundle, uh, it's, you know, quantum multiplication up to like a, a plus or minus sign, which is like this modified quantum multiplication uh, is just, you know, the cut product uh, plus H bar is a, a parameter, which is um, uh, really, you know, it can be a formal parameter or maybe it's like a, uh, you take like a generic one parameter deformation of the corresponding hypercalar and um, it's sort of scales that deformation uh, of just sum over alpha uh, greater than zero, which are roots in uh, G hat S uh, direct sum the Heisenberg of NS perp uh, of E um, alpha um, E minus alpha Z to the alpha over one minus Z to the alpha 
uh, under a correspondence between these roots and effective classes and the corresponding surface. So um, uh, hopefully this is a, a milestone towards proving this formula. So I have uh, two questions. One is kind okay. of a meta question. And it was how much uh, you're kind of running out of time at the end. I mean, you, uh, how much was uh, there you wanted to say but didn't say? Uh, mostly, I mean, I could have done more details, so I'm, I mostly skip stuff in the middle rather than at the end. Uh, but, you know, th there are more ideas, right? So there's, um, uh, I, I probably don't have a whole other talk worth of things, although, I, I mean, I, I could, I guess, you know, go dig into the details of this. Um, well, yeah. maybe later in the summer, can we, can we come back and have it more slowly at the end? Because I think it was very fast at the end for Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. That's if, fine. If, could, if, if people, if people, if people feel the same, I kind of felt that was a little bit too fast at the end. And, you know, uh, yeah, I'd love to hear more. Yeah. So maybe, so, so you know, as, 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 as this paper takes shape, maybe we could listen to this again with more details about what happens at the end. Okay. And so then, uh, and so then, my second question was that this this reduction to a local computation, right? Right. But in principle, so in principle, if you're, um, you know, that kind of uh, whatever, Arborella Saka or somebody type Arborella Saka say theorem will say in general, it's always some curve, but maybe, you know, it has some loops at vertices, whatever, right? There's some, right, there's yeah, some Lie algebra, there's some Lie algebra associated to that quiver. And you think that Lie algebra will also, I think you can just transplant Lie, Lie algebra action from from the quiver model to your model, or you have uh, there's some specific. Yeah, so th this is actually kind a little bit strange because um, the uh, for this bridge line stability, it's actually not uh, the um, my uh, the space of stability conditions actually isn't one to one with um, uh, uh, quiver variety chambers around given points. There's kind of like a birational transformation between them. Um, so um, there, but, but yeah, essentially something similar, I really hope should work in general. Um, uh, yeah, I think it is a, a general phenomenon. Um, although more needs to be said about the relationship between lo local quiver calculations and bridge lens stability because they're, um, uh, I, I didn't draw the picture and if I do this again, I'd draw the picture next time, but the-, the Okay, so there's some, there's some more. Uh, there's some more details in how how you match what what happens at the, the blowdown that happens in your uh, local bridge on type computation. Yeah, that's right. And, and, yeah, what, and what happens with the curve right? There's some. There's some. There's some hidden details you didn't tell us. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, the deals. You know, the the space stability conditions is actually kind of. Uh, it's almost like a resolution of the uh, where all the planes overlap um, in the you know positive cone, mm -hmm. um, which. Uh, it's actually kind of nicer because then the shift is actually the shift, which you know relates different uh, alphas, different elements in the nearest area group, is is literally just actually a shift of sterility conditions. You don't have to do this kind of thing of shifting at a level one thing. It kind of resolves the uh, the locus of all the fans of the surface. Um, oh, I see. Uh, uh, so you don't really. So you don't. You're saying you don't really get a locus where you have lots of stuff happening locally. It's always kind of something you simple. Still do, but it. Um, uh, it's 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 a little bit complicated. Uh, okay, okay. It takes a while to draw the picture. Okay. Um, uh, it it is you know it's related to these spherical twists. So it uh, you know at the locus um, uh, there's there's lots of different. Um, so you, you want so let's take the the point in the positive cone that corresponds to sim n of the blown down surface. Um, the inverse image of this point in the space of stability conditions is actually uh, very much disconnected. It's the, uh, the complement of some hyperplanes in an affine arrangement corresponding to the, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know, root system, affine root system and the corresponding curves in the surface. Um, All right. Um, uh, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, I, maybe this is silly, but are is there this Bridgeland stability story lurking behind these Malika constructions for simplex resolutions in some sense? Um, did you uh, 
if anybody attended um, Mina's uh, Agonajic's talks and the, the UCLA Distinguished Lecture Series, um, you know, attended virtually, I guess. Um, yeah, there seems to be something, uh, something going on there um, that, uh, you know, um, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's something there. Um, you know, I, I mean, another thing is, you know, there should be on these, um, you know, correspondences that are locally the HECA correspondences for Kriver varieties, uh, I think there should be line bundles on these that give some sort of, um, you know, you take this construction, which is already like an affinization, and you take like another affinization, like a, a quantum affinization of some sort of this, and uh, that algebra should act on um, K theory. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't thought uh, in too much detail about this construction yet. But um, yeah, there should be like a, there should be relations there. All right. Well, let's all thank Sam, and and I guess we will, we're looking forward to uh, continuation to more details later in the summer. So, thanks so much. Thank you. Oh.